Tonight on the show, we got actor, director, producer, Ray Buffer. Stay tuned. Welcome to Talking Junk. I'm your host, Jason Melendez. Melendez. Live now every week on Friday. Talking Junk. A multitude of professionals in different aspects, different walks of life. You have to come on and talk junk like a normal person. Welcome to Talking Junk, the podcast that comes to you live every Friday night from YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. We got a great episode for you tonight. We got actor extraordinaire, Mr. Ray Buffer. How you doing tonight, Ray? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Jason. Hey, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. So uh, I understand you, we, we're not going to take up too much of your time because you're, you're. I know you're a very busy man and you got prior engagements. Yeah, I'm, I'm in my car because I wanted to drive here and just kind of be stationary uh, before going in. But I, I did a, like a little supporting role in a film um, uh, at, a, at, a, at a university, and they're screening it tonight, so I wanted to show up and support. Um, wow. But I also didn't want to be caught on the freeway, so got here a little right. bit early, parked, and now I'm talking to you. So what's the name of the movie that's premiering tonight? The one that's premiering tonight, uh, it's a student filmmaker. Her name's uh, Ella, Ella, Genevi- Ella Javise, um, and the film is called Smartass, The Feral Son. It's an interesting premise. It's uh, uh, about a father who has um, kind of a hybrid son. He's like uh, part, part animal, part human, and kind of hides him away, sequesters him, keeps him a secret. Uh, in a log cabin in the middle of the woods where he lives and takes care of him in secret. And, um, so it kinda, it's kind of like Sweet around. Tooth. Kind of like Sweet Tooth. His birthday comes around and some friends come from the city to visit him. And it's kind of like he's having a moment with his son where his son is like coming of age and wanting to go off on his own. And there's like this goodbye going on between them while he's also still trying to hide the fact that he has a son that's that's half animal from his friend. So it's an interesting premise. Sounds very interesting. Now, you do know who Sweet Tooth was because you're an avid comic book collector. <laughs> I am. You know, I have to confess, though, I didn't uh, actually read uh, Jeff Lemire's Sweet Tooth before watching the series. It, you know, back in the day when I collected comic books, Comic books were a lot more popular, you know, the circulation was much higher back then, and there were very few movies based on comic books. I mean, Superman the movie with Christopher Reeve, that was was one of the first ones that that, that caught uh, caught my love of of that genre, and now it's almost flipped. It's like comic book circulation is minimal to where they have to have second and third printings a lot of the time, and the movies, I mean, basically comic books are 98% of the movies that are out there. Oh, yeah. So you must have been excited when you were uh, on the set of Daredevil and the Hulk. Yeah, I was. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a DC guy. So, uh, you know, I have, to, I have to pull back my excitement a little bit. But, yeah, I was, I was still excited to be uh, in. There was like a, a wedding uh, downtown black tie scene for Daredevil. Um, and that was back in the early 2000s. I was doing a lot of background extra work. But it was cool to be on the set and to see uh, Ben and Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, you know, right? And um, <laughs> and then also uh, to be part of Ang Lee's Hulk, that very first uh, Hulk movie. You know, I think I think it got a bad a bad rap, but I mean, he tried to do some some very stylistic things that I thought were cool. Yeah, those those uh, dogs were amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and you know, that CGI was like just beginning to get good. And right. you know, you have to look at things like that with a forgiving eye. You know, it's it's not Plan Nine from Outer Space or something. You know, it's it's still it's very worthy. Right. So, how long have you been acting? 
probably um, since I was uh, been 15, 14, 15, so I guess 35, 37 years. With 67 credits under your belt as an actor. That's a, that's a great <laughs> I haven't counted them. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of that early stuff is background, uncredited work, but, you know, I kind of went for it in the early 2000s and got a certain amount of success and then it kind of fell off. And I, I went back into, you know, doing the, doing the survival jobs, working for the man. And um, around 2007, 2008, I got that entrepreneurial spirit again. Started a couple theater companies, did that thing for a while. And then I got back into TV film just before the pandemic. And I really just been booking a lot and, and working towards booking a lot since then. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that... that I don't fall off of the off of the ramp again. I think I think I think I've got a good balance going on right now. It it looks like you got a pretty great balance going on right now. You just completed two movies. It's uh, telling me here, and you have about six in pre production and two that you're filming right now. Yeah, it sounds about right. Um, you know, IMDB is a little bit of smoke and mirrors, you know, but it's it's all marketing and promotion. There's there's a few things in development that who knows if they'll ever see the light of day. But um, right. But you know, you you put yourself out there. You try to. I, I firmly believe that work begets work. So you got to keep you got to keep churning the PR. You got to keep showing people that you're in different stages of work, and right. and that attracts people. You know, it's it's like. It's like working in a retail store. If you see a group of people around a table looking at one T-shirt, then that group of people gets bigger and bigger. So, you know, you, you got to kind of play that marketing game as well and uh, generate work. Are you a uh, wrestling fan? You know, when I was growing up, uh, I had a, one of my best friends was. He actually had a wrestling rink in, the, in his backyard, and, and he, he would pretend he was like Dusty Rhodes and, we would like wrestle in his backyard. Um, but I wasn't, I, I, I didn't know all the players, you know, I, I knew Jake the snake and some of the, you know, people from the day, but uh, I haven't followed it lately, but um, it's a lot. It is lately. interesting. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big guy. So when I get cast, it's usually for thugs and bad guys and villains and wrestlers, you know? So I played, I played a few wrestlers, played a few football players, um, it's just one of those niches I fall into. Most recently, you played The Undertaker on an episode of Evil. Yeah. Yeah, from behind. You know, they, they, uh, there's a, a new genre of, like, reenactment shows that, that's, like, uh, growing and growing. And um, I, I tend to get booked on some of those things. Uh, this was a, a reenactment show, uh, WWE Evil, where they interview um, the real Undertaker, and then they show him in flashbacks. So I was used for some of the flashbacks, you know, a little blurry, you know, tall guy in the hat and everything walking. But um, it was cool. I mean, it was cool to, I mean, he's like six inches taller than I am. So, I mean, or even more. I, I think he's seven foot or 6'11", and I'm only 6'4", so I'm a peewee. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it was kind of cool to, to walk his walk for a, for a day. Listen, I'm 5'8". That's Pee Wee. <laughs> <laughs> How, did you uh, get the authentic garb or was it uh, kind of a second um, sewing of it? Like a costume? Yeah, um, it, seemed, it seemed really authentic. It, it didn't seem like it was like out of the Halloween store or something. It was, it was you know, real leather vest, real leather pants, real the real big hat and, you know, I think it was a human hair wig. So, I mean, they, they had a pretty good budget. They wanted it to look correct. So it was good stuff. What was uh, your favorite role so far? Mm. Well, you know, I, I don't know if I have a favorite, but the one that comes to mind that I'm looking forward to seeing um, is a film I just uh, finished called um, Such Simple Deception. Uh, which is a day in the life of a private investigator who specializes in divorces. So, um, and in the course of the story, you learn that his wife is actually potentially stepping out on him. 
So it's a it's a day day in his life from beginning to end in which he makes this kind of discovery, and he also meets with a couple of clients and does a surveillance. And, um, you know, it's a short film, but it's it's a nice little character study. So I'm looking forward to maybe seeing that uh, come to light in a few months. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Have you done any voiceover work? I have, um, not as much as I'd like to, but um, I think my manager tells me I need to get better, better equipment. But <laughs> I have a, I have a reel out there, and you know, I mean, but that's always a balancing act with actors. Um, you know, how much money are you going to pour into equipment? You know, or even with musicians. You know, you always want the latest, greatest thing, but it's like, do I really want to pour thousands of dollars into like studio equipment or? you know, maybe play the odds and book two out of 10 things that I audition for and just be happy with that. So I'm, I'm figuring that out right now, but yeah, I do voiceover work. So I'd like to do more. Um, I'd like to do more actually in the, um, the video game realm, you know, the, the animation realm. Right. Um, I've it's done pretty big. most of my voiceover work has been like on commercials. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you're getting into production and directing now too though yeah um well i'm not so much in film I, I did direct and produce a documentary back in the early 2000s um having to do with female relational aggression it was uh, based on the true story of a girl in canada who actually um, she committed suicide after being bullied by three girls basically the story of her story was um, part of a compressed story that went into creating Mean Girls and stories okay. like that. that um, so, uh, yeah, I, I did a documentary that went through the film festival circuit back in 2003 called Rats and Bullies um, with my then wife, now ex-wife. Um, and she's carrying the ball now and she's got other projects based on that same concept that she's pursuing. Uh, but that was my foray into directing and producing. Um, I haven't I've been kind of happy just showing up and learning my lines and being the actor right now. Um, I don't really have uh, any ambition of directing right away unless it's for some kind of self-real purpose, you know, the, some kind of promotional purpose. Right. But um, I've been getting enough work in other people's projects that I don't really feel I need to do any self-producing. Um, but a lot of, you know, even A-list celebrities, they self-produce. They, you see them listed as executive producer on these big budget films that are coming out. So, oh, yeah. you know, they like to have control and, and I understand that. So, um, Speaking of control, how were you able to control the flow of work during this pandemic? Because I see you're very busy uh, or... Like you said, IMDb would like to paint you as busy, but how? How well, yeah, did, was, how did I was it? Busier than most. Yeah, you you look like you're busier than most. Not not a lot of things are in uh, production, and it's usually some of the same players nowadays. How did you uh, break that curve and start getting in there? Yeah, I mean, I have to say the the industry itself, um, you know, changed you know, with, with the pandemic and we went to this self tape mode of auditioning, you know, it used to be, you'd have to spend an entire day driving into LA parking, sitting in a waiting room, learning your lines, going in, waiting some more, getting back in your car, paying a ticket, getting gas, driving home, rush hour traffic. So maybe you get one, one audition in an entire day, but, um, with the pandemic, um, I've been able to um, do maybe seven or eight auditions in a day, you know, and, and so that's, I, I think. Are they all remote the, now? That, well, they were, and now they're coming back to where you, you do some in person now, but a lot of them still are remote because I think the casting directors have found a comfort in, in, in doing the remote auditions. Um, the actors, of course, still have a comfort in it, so. I mean, just natural uh, arithmetic, you know, if you're doing seven as opposed to one a day, your odds are going to go up as far as booking work. However, right. a lot of people I know weren't booking work and they were still auditioning a lot. So I don't know. I don't know what about me was more attractive during the pandemic, but I know I was more attracted to auditioning because 
I'm actually kind of an introvert. I don't really like the in-person driving to the auditions. Um, so doing it from the comfort of my own home was was actually liberating for me. It seems so because you you made sure you were, uh, I guess, you you made sure you made yourself known during these auditions since you've been getting a lot more. Um, have you succeeded in most of your goals as an actor? Um, I mean, I set reasonable goals, so I would have to say yes, because um, I think I think one reason that that a lot of actors give up is they don't set reasonable goals. You know, they they they're pie in the sky. They want they want that success right now. They want that that moment. You know, um, of glory. And it comes over time. And, I, I, you know, if you were to ask me a next step that in my career, it would be booking like a season regular as a bit role, like a, a guy with three or four lines an episode. Maybe, you know, it could be like the, the precinct sergeant sitting at the desk when you first walk into a, a procedural show. You know, he's, he's there every episode. He says three or four lines, and then right. the episode progresses. You that kind of look like the bailiff from Night Court. Oh yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah, and actually, they're bringing <laughs> Night Court back. So are they? You know, wow. John, yeah, John Larroquette, I think, is bringing it back. Um, I think he's in it, and I think they're. I had read somewhere that Harry Anderson's um, daughter was going to be in it as well. So it was kind of like a legacy thing. Okay, um, but I don't know where that project is. But yeah, Richard Mole, who's now he has to be in his late eighties. Now that's who I, I would get a lot of comparisons with. I also get uh, David Harbor, you know, who was uh, Red Guardian. That would be my cosplay character, Red Guardian from Black Widow. If I ever dressed up and did the whole Marvel superhero thing. Yeah, but, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. But you're you're a DC yeah. guy. So who who would your uh, your dream DC role be? Without having to shave, I guess. Um, Maybe Starman. I don't know. I, I, you know, there's there's very few fully bearded um, DC heroes that I can think right. of. You're a little too tall um, to be Lobo. I am. Maybe I could be. Uh, I could be some original new Green Lantern. That would be cool. Right. Right. You can't. You can't <laughs> be the uh, the asshole one. I always forget his name. Oh. Uh, yeah, I can't think of his name either. Um, what, what would you tell an aspiring actor about trying to break into the business nowadays? I, well, going back to what we were talking about, I'd say set reasonable goals, you know, um, also you have to have a certain amount of etiquette, you know, when you show up to set, you know, you have to treat the people right who check you in for the audition. You know, you have to remember that your reputation starts in the parking lots when they see you get out of your car. You know, you've got to, you've got to make a good impression and, and, you know, you've got to be polite. It's not really about talent. I mean, talent is what gets you in the door. Talent is what, you know, talent is like the price of admission. But what they're really looking at when they talk to you in a, in a casting is, is this person a weirdo? Is this person going to be cool <laughs> to work with? You know, are they going to make my job easier or are they going to make it harder? And so you don't want to go in there with like tons of OCD issues and, you know, be high maintenance because they don't have time for that. You know, they, they want right. they want a nice, smooth and steady shoot. So as as even nobody wants to work with a diva. level headed. Yeah, I mean, there are, I guess. Some, some celebrities out there that are, are I, maybe it's developed over time or maybe they walk into the room that way and they're just, they're successful because they're just uber talented. But um, I think for a new actor, the, the more level-headed you can be, the more normal you can be, um, the better, you know. Now, with that said, I also kind of go into auditions with an I don't care attitude because I think sometimes actors, new actors in particular, have this energy like, oh, I really need this job. Oh, 
don't you, would you like to see me do this? Or can I do that for you? Can I, you know, it's almost like a, you're begging for the job. And I think uh, casting directors, directors, producers, they all sense that. They sense your, your vibe. They sense your energy. And you really can't, you can't, you can't want it so bad that you're oozing need. You know, you need to right. go in there like, okay, I could take it or leave it. Hey, this is what I have to offer you today. If it's good enough for you, I'd love to work with you. If not, see you next time. You know? Is there a, a certain way you should maybe present your um, your portfolio? You mean for new actors? Your headshot? Yeah, for new actors. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I do what I do. Um, I don't know what the, what the newest rules are. You know, they always change. Back in the day, I was actually just saying this to someone else, back in the 80s or what have you, it was everyone had black and white laser scan headshots. And sometimes they were three quarters. Sometimes they were, you know, shoulders and up. Uh, and then, then it became color. And then everybody had to print them at a certain place. Sometimes they were glossy. Sometimes they were flat, you know, or matte. Um, and nowadays, I, I can't even remember the last time I gave someone an actual physical headshot. It's all electronic. So, you know, you have to choose as an actor or performer where to spend your money. Uh, I, I like to get a few professional photos, but then I also have an iPhone, I don't know what this is, 12 or 13 that I'm talking on. You know, it's got three oh, so you cameras can take your on own it. pictures then. It's got a timer. I can set it in the corner. I know where the sun is. I can look into the sun, and then I can get my, my right angle. I can look up and, you know, take my own headshot. So, right. um, you know, I, I keep my looks fresh that way. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of different looks available as well. So, I mean, I can be Frankenstein. I can be Santa. I can be a cowboy. I can be the guy with the beard. I can be the guy without the beard. You know, so having one static headshot doesn't really work for a character actor like myself because I want to show people Your all diversity. the difference. Yeah, and they don't always have the best imagination. So you have to right. really like illustrate it for them and say, see, this is what I look like with a beard and mustache. This is what I look like with just a mustache. This is what I look like with just a beard. You know, So you have to go through all those hoops. Wow. Well, it's worth it after that. You get to do what you sure. love. Yeah. Now, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm just going to add to that. Do, do, let me just let me just add to the, yeah. the do what you love thing. You know, back in the day, I wanted to do what I love, but I would have to starve to do it, and that's because we didn't have this lovely gig economy that we have now, where you can have four or five part-time jobs and and still do what you love, and so. I think that also has been liberating, you know, in, in, the, in the past five or six years where I found a balance where I know that if all of a sudden things nosedive and I'm not booking, you know, paying acting work, then I can fall back on a few things and still pay the rent, you know. So it's, it's not as desperate as it, as it was 20 years ago where you had to have that salary job working for the man in order to make ends meet. Um, there are lots of little nuances and things that you can do that, that allow you to balance things out today. Right. Right. Which is why you see a lot of actors get part-time jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think I, I can't remember who it was, but someone, someone who, who is a, a well-known name was waiting tables somewhere, you know, in, in between gigs and, Someone spotted him and made a big, big deal out of it. But people that, gotta make that a living too. Stereotype. That is the stereotype that actors wait tables. That's that's one of the things they do, you know. And that's I, not uh, just I, actors. I, yeah, I mean, it's all, all. I mean, even crew members, people, you know, grips and lighting people. I mean, you know, things dry up for them. They they have other jobs that they go and do. They're not identified as just one thing. And really, I think it's better for an actor to get out there and diversify and learn other jobs because that's going to make them a better actor. Now they can act like a bartender because they bartended. 
you know? Right. The, is all right. So, when you first starting into business, you don't just bring your resume in there because obviously you don't have an acting resume. You probably have a nine to five resume, and that doesn't resonate over, does it? You're saying going into an audition as a as a beginner? Yes. Yeah. No. You don't. You don't typically give them like your traditional monster dot com work resume. Um, if you have no credits, if you're like a college student or a high school student or if someone who's transitioning, maybe you used to be a neurosurgeon and now you just got to be an actor, you, you don't necessarily bring your neurosurgeon resume into the audition. You might say, hey, I'm changing paths in my life and I'm building, I'm building a, a new career. Here's a, here's a, a picture of me in the play that I just did or here's a playbill or here, you know, here's a resume with like two or three lines of things that I've done, but I'm just now getting started and I'm taking classes from so-and-so or, you know, I'm doing this or I'm in this improv workshop. But, you know, you, you basically explain your lack of resume or your lack of experience. And in doing so, you audition because now they can, they, they see how you're speaking extemporaneously about your own background and your own change of life. It shows a lot about your character also. Sure. Now, before I let you go, because I know you got this premiere, I got to touch a little bit on the singing. Okay. Yeah, I that was the first thing, really. I will actually, the, the first thing I, well, I would say, yeah, it's kind of weird. I, I have a memory when I was five of being in a play ringing a bell. Um, and that was my first acting experience that I remember. But um, I didn't really want to pursue acting from that experience alone. I think I think what ignited my love of the arts was um, beginning to play violin in fifth grade in an after school program, which then became singing in a chorus once I got to middle school. And that progressed into, oh, there's this thing called musical theater where you're acting on stage and you're singing um, and you're dancing, but I'm not a dancer, but, <laughs> music, but singing and acting, right? So I was like, well, that's really interesting. And so I, I developed a love for that in high school. Um, so my, my, my singing experience is mostly from a musical theater background. Um, I have done opera work. I have done classical work. I do have a a regular church gig where I sing, you know, um, church music. Um, and I do caroling and, and, and these types of things. But, um, but my, my love, my forte is, is uh, musical theater. Would you ever consider doing some singing voice work, uh, voiceover work? Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that comes into the voiceover work. And actually that, that's the kind of voiceover work I've been booking mostly because I just did a, a voice of a singing bear for a musical, a short film musical at USC, um, uh, which is coming out, uh, I guess, in a, in a little bit. And um, then prior to that, I think I mentioned to you the, the Red Cross, um, the Red Cross PSA that I did where I was a singing eyebrow. Um, and it was a it was a PSA about smoke alarms, and um, so that that was a singing voiceover. You know, I, I wasn't physically on camera, but you hear my voice, and I'm singing. So, um, yeah, I, I love those That's, kind of gigs. Sounds amazing. Well, I know it's you got to get. It sounds fun. I, I I'm I want to aspire to do some uh, voiceover work myself, but I got a lot of. Uh, work to do i don't even know how to start getting uh you know booking auditions well it sounds like it's, it looks like you have a good setup there i would encourage you just to listen to some commercials that you like and you think hey i could sound like that or i could do those kind of voiceovers well and then Ray, transcribe them i What's already that? do there you go then just transcribe them out re and record yourself doing them and that's your reel I try on TikTok all the time. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much, because I know you're a busy man. Like I said, you're sitting in the parking lot right now waiting for your premiere to start. So yeah, the, thank the you. The sun keeps moving on me. I apologize. No, don't apologize. Everything was great. The interview was great. I thank you very much for joining me, and hopefully we can get you on another episode. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. You have a wonderful weekend. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Junkers, tomorrow night in the break room, we are going to play Cards Against Humanity. So stay tuned for that because you know for a fact that we get a little crazy. All right, who the fuck am I kidding? We get a lot crazy. So just tune in. Be sure to bring your drink and put your fucking kids to bed. <laughs>